All right, we, uh, we're going to get rolling this morning. So basically what we've been doing, if, you're, if this is your first time with us, you're like, that's weird, they have three people up there. Uh, so what we're doing is we're actually going to be taking uh, the questions that you've given us on these little things uh, throughout this series, uh, and we're going to be answering them as you've asked them. Now, just to share with you uh, kind of how we're going to do it, first of all, we've got all the questions that we have so far that are going to be up on the screen so you can see them, and you can see it as we, as we walk through that. And then one of us will probably take the lead on that, And then inevitably, because we all like to talk, we'll probably talk over each other a little bit too uh, and have a little fun uh, working through that. So the guys that are here, first of all, to my right, uh, this is Don Stewart, uh, and he's one of our elders here. Uh, Outside of uh, his wife, Amy, uh, he's the longest person uh, here at Friendship that's been here this long. Um, So that's that's great. Um, He he apparently didn't get the memo. So, um, but uh, he... (laughs) Anyways, yeah, haha. Um, so uh, he's, uh, he's also one of the financial coaches that we have here. Uh, he's gone through Financial Peace University. He's one of the coaches. And then to my left uh, is Josh, also one of our elders, also gone through Financial Peace University. Uh, and he is younger than both of us. So, um, <clears throat> so he's going he's gonna to have a lot of fun today doing that. So um, the reason that we've done this series, the reason that we typically do about once a year, once every 18 months, uh, a financial series is because we believe that if you love Jesus, if you're following Jesus, there are three parts that we think are necessary, and that we think that you should be growing spiritually deeper, that you should become financially stable, and that doesn't mean that you have all sorts of money. It means that you handle the money that God has given you well in a way that honors God and relationally satisfied. And so we always hit all three of those things throughout the year because we believe that's part of the discipleship process to help you become who God has called you to be. Now, as, we've go, as we go through these questions, if we have time at the end, uh, we'll take live questions. But to be quite honest with you, we have 10 questions, and the likelihood of us each talking at least three minutes for each of those questions is pretty high. Now, some of you went, wait a minute, that's three times three is nine. Okay, we're not we'll talk three total minutes. That's 30 minutes, so really. Relax. If you need to slip out because the Colts game, I will probably slip up with you. Um, so, but here's what I want you to do, okay? Uh, if you're sitting there and we go through a question, you're like, man, I have another question that's based off of that. Reach out in front of you and grab that card um, and write the question down. And as you leave, drop it in the giving and connect boxes on your way out. And what we're going to do is any questions that we get throughout the morning today, we'll put them in an email and we'll give the answer to that. Uh, I'll probably put that on my blog as well so that you can get access to that whenever you want to. And so that way we're answering your questions as well. But guys, before we begin, um, I was actually... Uh, handed a card on the way, uh, way this morning to, to, to get this done. And so I, I really thought this was a very important question that we should kind of hit at the beginning. Uh, and so here's the question. And all these are anonymous, by the way. So don't be like, I'm going to put the question on there. They're going to do a handwriting analysis. No, we're not going to do that. So Crystal asks, um, <laughs> should, <laughs> should I sell my husband's Detroit Lions, Red Wings, and Tom Brady memorabilia to pay off debt? <laughs> so the answer is yes, but I don't know how much it's actually going to do because they're not worth very much. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So I said to Anthony, I'm like, Anthony, you have to be in here this morning for the first question. He's like, why? I'm like, just, just, just do it. So, okay. So here, here is our first question. We're going we're gonna to a- ask it, and then uh, we'll kind of get rolling. So here's our first question. Uh, we have never invested or saved well. What amount is a good amount to invest in the beginning? 1,000, 10,000. Listen, if you have 10,000, we need to have a conversation. Um, 10,500, at what amount should you start? So, so I, I really thought that number was going to be 1,000, 10,000, or 500,000. So then we definitely were going to have to have a conversation. But no, I, I'm really excited that we started here because often when we talk about money, we talk about a budget, it feels constraining, it's awkward, it's difficult. But when we start talking about investing, right, that's where we're able to take your income and convert it to this giant wealth building tool, right? And tonight when we do the morning the morning workshop, we will talk about compound interest and how you can take $10,000 and over, you know, a certain duration of time you can talk about about making that into hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, right? So that is that is a huge asset. When we talk about it in FPU, you know, we start talking about diversification and how and in what ways we can use that. Now, I realize it says, when should we start? And obviously, the sooner you start, the more you will have. But if you start too soon, you'll run into some issues. You know, in Proverbs 21, 20, it says, 
The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. So even if we start gulping too early into our retirement or into our investments, we, we can run into issues. We'll cover some of those issues later. Now the question was, um, when, so let me hit that again. So not, not too soon, but after you've got your $1,000 kind of saved up, we, what we call your Murphy protection, then we start talking about your debt snowball, and then once your full emergency is in place, which is kind of dependent upon you and your situation, um, it's usually three to six months of expenses. Um, again, in FPU, we're going to talk about you and uh, your specific situation. Um, you know, what, what are you going through? What is the right age to start? Uh, where are your finances? You know, all those kinds of different things. But uh, right after you have all those done is when we start investing, right? And the, the rule of thumb is 15%, but if you're closer to retirement, it may need to be more. If you're uh, younger, but you only have one income, it may need to be less, right? We're kind of trying to prioritize those things to make sure that we're considering your budget, your age, and all the other factors, right? So again, the sooner, the better, and the uh, righteous man leaves an inheritance for his children, right? And that's really what we want to help you do. You want to add anything to that, Don? No. Okay, question number two. Does the Bible say anything uh, about allowance for children? Now, when the three of us were going through this, I said, you know what? I have no kids that still would get an allowance, and so I don't want them to be able to hold anything over the two of your head because you still have kids at home. So I'll take this one. Uh, no, the Bible doesn't say anything about allowance. Uh, in fact, uh, the Bible doesn't really say a whole lot about uh, money and children except for one thing, and that is that you are to teach them how to handle what God has given them. You're to teach them that. Now, how you go about doing that is really up to you and your spouse, and I encourage you to actually have that conversation. Um, the, the challenge that I would say is a lot of times when people think allowance, they think, here's money. There you go. It's yours to spend. Uh, that's not necessarily teaching them anything. It's not really giving them any type of incentive as to why they're getting that. They're not earning that. Um, so I would say if there's an allowance that's to be paid, it should be, again, my opinion, all the children in the room that are here, first of all, we have a space for you. Second of all, uh, so you wouldn't be hearing this, uh, but if you're old enough to be in here and still in high school or whatever, uh, don't hate me on this, but they're getting money for nothing, and that's not the real world. It's, it's just not. So allowance should probably be, be tied to some type of chore, uh, uh, some type of thing that they do that's a requirement for them to be able to get that. So they're seeing that there is both um, uh, a result of their effort uh, and something they can do. Now, your family goes, well, we have chores that are already, because quite frankly, they're a part of our home. Uh, we provide for them a house. We provide for them food. We provide for them clothing. That's your allowance. That's awesome. No problem whatsoever. Go for it. But if you're like, hey, we want to do something, then at least structure it in a way where you're teaching them about that. Uh, and you're allowing them to be able to learn kind of the idea and the value of a dollar because it really, it really should matter to them because at some point in time, they're not going to be in your house. And I'll tell you this, if you don't teach them the value of the dollar, they'll be back in your house. Just think about it. Uh, so teach them that and do that. You guys want to add anything to that? So I'll, I'll add uh, one thing to that. It, it's just a really cool experience. Like we, we do the chores and the kids have an opportunity to earn the money. And, you know, you have that wonderful opportunity when you're in the, the toy aisle of the store, right? And uh, the kid wants every toy. And it's really cool for um, Melissa and I, we have a little app that we share, and it says how much each kid has in their, uh, what we call dad bank. It's what they earn through their chores. And so we pull it up, and uh, they're like, can we get this? And we look, and we're like, no, you cannot. That's $25. You have only done so many chores. You, you cannot afford that. And it's just a really cool experience to see them go back and forth and start to understand what the value of some of these things are. And I've actually seen my kids slowly actually buy gifts for other kids or help kids out or do other things. So it's kind of created this, this giving, this, um, this kindness, and this respect for the resource that is money instead of the, the love of money. So that's just been a really cool experience. Cool. All right, next question. Uh, should I tithe on money before or after taxes? Yeah, this is one of those fun questions, right? So before... Josh, you seem to be taking a lot of questions here. I'm just saying. Um, I may be younger, but I like to talk, so... <laughs> 
You're welcome. Um, we will still get out for the Colts game. So, D Dave, Dave did a fantastic job uh, last week and uh, over the this whole series talking about you know kind of the the aspects of money and we talked specifically about tithes. So hopefully you guys picked up on that tithe is 10% of your income. So the big question is before or, or after taxes. Well, before we hit that, you know we were called to trust God with our first fruits, which is why we tithe, and that the whole purpose of that is so that we can receive the blessings, not necessarily financial blessings, but the blessings. Of associated for that. So we want whatever you do to be out of a, a cheerful heart, right? That is that is what we want you to do. And then also, I want to point out that uh, out of all the different polls that have been done, only 21% of all Christians actually give anything to their church. So before we start talking about giving 10%, maybe we should start talking about giving something and giving out of a heart of kind and respect. Also, the average giver of those that give, so of the 21% of Christians, on average, they give 2 to 3% of their income. So again, we're nowhere close to tithing yet, so we, we need to improve. So I want to start by just saying, before we start worrying too much about uh, before taxes or after taxes, we should probably start worrying about making sure we have a budget that's in alignment um, with what we've been called to do and showing a, a love and a kindness to God by giving our first fruits and trusting in him so that we can be cheerful and, and start to experience those things. But the answer to that question for me personally, because I, I can't find anywhere in the Bible where it talks about before or after taxes, I give before because I'd rather be standing in front of God saying, I did everything that I said or that you asked me to do, and then some, because in the New Testament, it doesn't just ask us to tithe, but it asks us to be generous. So that's beyond that. So I, I try to go with the uh, before taxes approach and just figure if I'm standing in front of Jesus, I want to say, hey, I tithe and him not to go, well, let's talk about this. So, <laughs> Okay. I know we've got another question coming right up with tithe. So we'll just kind of roll into that one. Do, do I tithe and pay credit card debt, uh, student loans, car debt, whatever, or pay off debt, then tithe? All right, everybody's thinking, man, he just sits back here and real quiet, plays the drums and everything. But for those that know me, you're never going to shut me up now. And I'm sorry. Uh, I can talk a lot about this. So, um, yeah, yeah, great question. So, um, we're going to talk about principles. What, what does God want us to do in, in the Bible? So, uh, first thing to think about with that question is um, if we're going to wait to pay off debt, most people come out, they have credit card debt, uh, maybe they have school debt, then they get a home. And so if we're always saying, let's take care of these other things in life first, uh, either people are never going to be tithing for their whole life um, or it's going to be, uh, you know, when they're 65 years old is when they're going to start. Uh, but what we really want to look at is the biblical principle of first fruits. And this is, this is key. So uh, a couple scriptures here to talk about um, how God spoke about this because uh, the nation of Israel was doing the same thing. They were kind of starting to cheat uh, God in the sense that he told them to bring in the tithe and they would say, well, we're going to not do our first fruits. We're going to give things that aren't the best. We're going to maybe not give all of it. And he has a few, there's a few scriptures here I want to just um, talk about. One, Malachi 3.10, he's saying, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. In Proverbs 3.9, he says, honor the Lord from what you make and from the first of all you produce. That's the first fruit principles. In other words, I do that first. Deuteronomy 14.2, you shall surely tithe of all the produce from what you sow. Leviticus 27, 10% of everything you harvest is holy. Holy meaning set apart, means before anything else, I'm setting this apart. It's holy, and it belongs to me, says God. Um, so it's clear that we should be tithing, giving all, all the time um, in these things. Now, um, recognize that's, that's a struggle for some people, right, in doing that. But I want to be clear, there's times when we will, uh, as we coach people, I've been coaching for decades, actually, financial coaching, and we've recommended people start with giving something. But when it comes to the biblical principle, the biblical principle teaches tithe first above everything else. Before we fund our lifestyle, we should give to God. And that is an act of obedience. It's also an act of faith. Um, and I think that actually there's something there for people that are tithing um, already uh, and giving. Uh, there's uh, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 23, and he says, uh, Pharisees or teachers of all your show-offs, he says, you're in trouble. You give God a tenth of everything you have, but you neglect the more important matters of the law, such as justice and mercy and faithfulness. And then Jesus says, these, these first things are important things. 
You should have done those. This is, that's, I love that scripture because people say, well, tithing's never talked about in the New Testament. They're literally talking about tithing and Jesus says twice, he says, it's very important. And he says, you should be doing those things without neglecting the latter of those things. So for those of us that are tithing, there's actually more. God's saying, look, there's a bigger picture here. This isn't about the rule of just 10%. This is about, he doesn't want 10% of our money. He wants 100% of us. He wants us to live in obedience and faith and trust to him. And I can tell you that never goes away, that trust, because you could be tithing and be out of debt and say, man, I could do more with that 10% um, by investing it. I've got this investment over here. I could grow it really big and make millions of dollars, and then I'd give all that away, right? It's very easy to think we can do better with that. And God's asking us to say, look, set it apart. Set it as holy, this amount to me, and give it to me and uh, show your, your faithfulness um, with that. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd kind of bounce off that too when uh, in the New Testament where Paul is talking about a church that, that was giving to him. And the first thing is he said, hey, this is, the, this is the need. And the first thing he says is they gave themselves first to God. That's the most important thing. That's really um, the overall concept of handling our finances is that's an overflow of us giving ourselves to God first and living our lives in a way that honors Him, and that overflows into our financial, uh, how we handle ourselves uh, financially with that. And so I think that's a, I think it's a super important thing. And again, we go back to why we do these series, because it's a, we, our, our desire is to teach a holistic approach in your discipleship with Jesus Christ. A lot of times, especially when I grew up, and those of you that are in Gen Xers, and if you grew up in church, um, a lot of times it was, you know, it was about memorizing Scripture. And if you had the Scriptures memorized and you had the, the Bible verses memorized and you had uh, the, the chapters and all those things memorized backwards and forwards, then you, you got the gold stars and you were the Christian. Now, you may have been the biggest jerk on the planet, but hey, you had them all memorized and that's all that really Jesus cares about, which is absolutely not. And the same thing goes for this. You know, some people are like, well, I have given 10% my entire life and you've never smiled once. Uh, you know, there's, there's a disconnect there. And, and it's really about that whole life uh, that God wants for us. And I do want you guys, because I know as we talk through these things, both of you brought this up. Uh, talk about the difference between um, what a tithe is and then like an offering or giving. Because I know you guys in your financial coaching have had a lot of that where it's like, um, I tithe. And I think, what was it, um, 13%, is that what you said, Josh, of people that go to church say that they tithe, but then when they looked into the details and actually asked what percentage, it was like 2%. So it's like, yeah, that's, okay. So I'll give you, I'm, I'm going to answer the question before. What, what, yeah, go, take that. Give it, give it, give it. <laughs> I, I missed the question, Dave. Oh. <laughs> My what's ADHD the, What's the difference between in? tithe oh. and like just giving? What, what's the difference between those two things? Well, a tithe means a tenth, right? So that's why it's, it's 10%. Uh, God actually, again, asks us to do uh, much more. So in the Old Testament, they were to give uh, tithes and offerings. So offerings is what we give over that. Um, and in the New Testament, we're told to be um, uh, abounding in generosity, right? So there's things that go way beyond, as he was just talking about, beyond the tithe. It's very easy if you're a tither to say, whew, check that off. Now I'm doing, I'm righteous, right? And God's saying, actually, I demand much more from you. Uh, again, when you look at the, uh, the, the poor uh, woman that gave just a penny or a shekel, um, Jesus criticized the people that went before her. Uh, he said, you gave out of your wealth. So he said, just because you, they were giving 10%, they were giving their tithes, and he criticized them. He says, you're not checking off. You're giving, it didn't even hurt. It didn't even uh, affect you to give that, a much, that much to, uh, to me. So he really wants, again, he wants our life. He wants us to be generous and joyful givers, and he wants so much more than a 10%. So a lot of times we're doing these rules and we're, we're you know, these, these questions, and we're getting very specific about amounts. But think about this as these, these are the principles. God wants us to have faith and trust in him. He wants the first fruits. He wants the best. He wants us to demonstrate that we, have, uh, that we trust him by giving him what he's asked for and then see what he does with the rest. Yeah, to, put, to put weight, if you will, on what we say we believe and see if it holds up. All right, next question. Uh, I had to chuckle when I read this, not going to lie, because what happens when I die? Well, <laughs> you die. Um, <clears throat> Hopefully you know Jesus and you go to heaven. Um, but the other part of this question I think is, is really important. Do I need a will and or a power of attorney? So I, I want to reference back real quickly, and I'll let you guys jump in. Um, a passage that Josh mentioned at the beginning, Proverbs 13, 22, that says, A good man will leave an inheritance for his children's children. What we're talking about, listen, if you're dead, 
Guess what you are? Dead. You don't care if your kids are fighting over it. You don't care if your grandkids are fighting over it. You don't care. You're gone. So this is not about you at this point in time. Um, it is literally about you trying to bless your family in a way uh, that there is much less uh, friction, consternation, arguing, and all that stuff that happens. And I tell you what, I've done hundreds of funerals, and it is amazing to me how families that are close-knit, they love each other, they're each other's best buddies, they've got a bazillion Facebook photos of each other doing vacations together, and the last parent dies, and it is a free-for-all because mom and dad didn't take care of things. Um, and the family splinters, and all sorts of problems happen. And so this is, it, it's, not, it's not a comfortable thing to talk about death. Now, most people don't go, hey, you want to sit down and have a conversation about what's going to happen after I die? Not many people get excited about that. If you do, and you're looking you know, like they're a spouse potential, right, a potential spouse, you may want to check them off your list. Um, but it's just one of those things. It's not an enjoyable conversation to have. But again, let's just kind of put the context. It's not about you at this point in time. So I'll let you guys run with it. I mean, yeah, so answering the question of do I need a will and or a power of attorney, so, so technically, no, you do not, right? Um, if you do not, I want you to know you're putting your, your hands and everything that Dave just talked about in terms of your family, stress, and everything else in the hands of the government. So, Well, you, we know how trustworthy they are. I was going to say, you, you guys feel free to think about what that means, means to you. And what, what I also think is, is really helpful is... I. I know personally when you try to sit down and, and you're trying to write a will, which we, we have helped numerous people do uh, through the process of FPU and through financial counseling, even outside of that, is that it seems overwhelming. It seems like this complex, very difficult thing that you have to go through. And uh, believe it or not, there's there's a very simple, easy way to do it. There's a lot of tools and resources out there. Um, there's a lot of uh, lawyers or attorneys that are more than happy to kind of sit down with you and walk through the basics, and, and we can do that as well. So I, I want you to kind of think about that as not in a very complex or in, a, an intimidating thing to go through, right? Um, and then, as Dave said, when you start thinking about your family and the aspects, right? You, when you leave, at least when I leave, I, I would like to leave a family that's that's healthy and happy and loving and following God. And the last thing I want is when they're celebrating my life going to heaven is for them to be celebrating all the assets and things that they gained or fighting over those so that, um, you know, it's kind of splinters that family or breaks things apart, right? I, I want that to be a cheerous, happy, happy time. And I, I think that everybody wants that too. So why don't you, you want to share what you were sharing with us about uh, what your, what your mom did? I think that's good. Uh, yeah. So, you know, whether you're talking healthcare directives or all of these, we aren't uh, attorneys. We can point you to the right direction for these resources. We did sleep at a Holiday Inn last night, though, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we had, so, uh, for example, my, uh, my mom is going through uh, dementia now, and so these documents were in place, and it's made it much easier for us, uh, for, for my siblings and myself to, to go through this. And last time we were um, with my wife, uh, parents, uh, she sat us all down and said, hey, kids, this is what I want. She gave us documents, making her, her wishes very, very clear um, with about what she wanted. So, or both of them did, uh, very clear. So it is a blessing to do that. And so, so think of it that in, in those terms of how can I bless those um, when I'm gone and not cause them the kind of strife. And I, and I would agree with that. I've seen many people very close who have just gone to war, it seems like, um, when that happens. And it's it's kind of shocking to see. So this is just one of those tools that you can, or several of those tools, actually, that you can use to, to help any of those difficult processes. Yeah, and I'll just wrap this up with um, <clears throat> wills do not have to be complex. People tend to think that they have to be super complex. It, it's basically a document that gives direction to how you want your estate taken care of. And it truly can be something as simple um, as a letter that, you know, is notarized each page and signed. That's not necessarily the strongest document, um, but at least that gives, you know, clear directives. But there's like easywill.com. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's out there. Um, stuff like that that you can simply go through and it'll just set it up for you. And I'm gonna tell you this too, because here's what typically people think. Well, I'm, I'm 65, so I should probably have a will. Actually, the reality is, is if you're 25 or you're 26 and you have children, that's probably the most important time you should have a will uh, because your will dictates who gets your kids. 
um, and who's supposed to take care of them and where if you have health insurance or life insurance, which you should, especially if you have children, you know, where that's going to go. It's super important to do that. So don't wait till like, well, when I'm old and decrepit and can't move anymore. Um, it's really more important um, on that front end. Okay, next question. Does FPU, Financial Peace University, which uh, Josh, you're teaching that this time, right? Okay, Josh, Josh and Melissa are teaching it. Uh, does FPU teach that there is, quote, unquote, good debt, and can debt sometimes be beneficial? Okay, I'm going to take a breath on this one. You may have to pull me off the, off the platform on this one. There's a lot to be said about this because I get this question, a question a lot. So first thing I want to clarify, I love the, the, the question there. Does FPU teach that there is good debt? So it really doesn't matter what FPU teaches. It doesn't matter what I teach or what Friendship Church teaches. What does the Bible teach? And so I'm going to challenge you on any of these, these things. If you don't agree, um, look at Scripture for yourself. What does God say about these things? And this is where we have to make a decision many times in life when something we think or we believe conflicts with what God says. And that's a critical thing in, in all of our, our lives. What are we going to do at that point? So um, does FPU teach that there um, is good debt? Um, and no, it doesn't. And I would agree with that because the Bible um, does not teach that there is good debt. Now, are there different kinds of debt? Absolutely, there are. I was trying to think of a way to, to think about just because something is not a sin, and the Bible does not say debt is a sin, but it never encourages it. It never says, go get debt. This is a good way. This is a way to advance, to become wealthy. The Bible never, ever talks about that. And it talks about money more than any other topic, pretty much. And so um, I was trying to think of a way to, to think about this, and I thought, you know what? Um, Something can, there can be different levels of things. And sometimes my kids, we, we try to buy healthy food. Anybody else do that? Um, and you, no. you, look at, you look at the ingredients on there. And so there's like three ingredients or something. And we're like, oh, that's healthy. That's really good. Um, and so some of the times our kids will go, oh, well, that's healthy. Those potato chips are healthy, right? Or if I want a donut and they're like, oh, well, that's not very healthy, but it's a whole wheat donut slathered in icing. Does that, does that make it good? Does that make it a good? No. Now, is it okay to sometimes have those, those things? Yes, but there's a difference between something being good and uh, beneficial and wise and something not being as bad. So the Bible is clear in many, many ways when it talks about that. Now, it's going to talk about money. And I have several scriptures here that I really think drive some things home. So I want you to, to think about what God is saying in these scriptures. In 1 Timothy 6, um, he's talking about godliness combined with contentment brings great profit. For we have brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take a single thing out. But if we have food and shelter, we will be satisfied with that. Those who long to be rich, do we long to be rich in this world? Those who long to be rich, however, stumble in temptation, into temptation and a trap and many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evils. And some people reaching for it have strayed from the faith and stab themselves with many pains. I'm going to keep going because I think these are so key. God's saying so many things about these. Romans 13, he says, oh, uh, 8 and 9, he says, Oh, no one anything except a debt of love. For the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Proverbs 22, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is the servant of the lender. Luke 12, 15, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of the abundance of of your possessions. God, when, when we look at debt, we start thinking, oh, there's this, these kinds of debt. There's, again, we, um, one of the people say there's, there's appreciating types of debt, right? We think of education or a home um, where we could say, we're going to take that debt out and it's going to grow. And so I'm going to just keep acquiring that kind of debt. It's still not good. If you had, if you graduated college and you had 25000 in debt, let's say, in student loans, and one of those billionaires that that's, you see on uh, YouTube, and t YouTube and stuff, they come on and they're forgiving all the debt uh, for everybody in the class. They get all excited. Would you walk up and say, yeah, I really appreciate the gesture, but my debt is good debt. I'm going to keep that. Now, you know, no thanks. Don't, don't pay that off. It is, it is not good debt, although there are different levels. So not against debt. We think it's a tool. We think it can be used in certain ways, but it can be a trap as well. And we need to understand God never, ever calls it um, a good debt. And I, one that, um, another section that I really think is, is interesting, it's fascinating to me when I first heard about this years ago, it comes from Deuteronomy. God's talking to the nation of Israel and how he's going to bless them. Okay, and he's he talking about the, the year of Jubilee, which is interesting. It kind of relates to, as we think about bankruptcy stuff, the year of Jubilee, where debts were forgiven. That was a blessing. God looked at it and didn't say debt is good, debt is bad. It's going to forgive. We're going to forgive you debt. 
and that's going to be a blessing. And so they're talking about, it's talking about the year of Jubilee every seven years. Um, and then it starts talking about some debt. And it said, um, let's see, every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people because the Lord's time for canceling debt has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, which is funny, but you must cancel debt for your fe fellow Israelites. However, there need, no be, need be no poor among you, for in the land the Lord your God has given you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. Now, only if you obey, fully obey the Lord your God and careful these commandments I'm giving you today, this is how he sums it up. The Lord God will bless you as he has promised, and you will lend to many nations, but you borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. Now, really think about that. He's talking from a big nation standpoint. Interesting. Anything in the news these days about debt and nations, if you've been paying attention, right? God is saying he's, uh, that debt is, uh, is a trap and is not something good, not a sin, to, to have that. And so I think we really need to think about the principle of that. And I would be remiss today if we're talking about debt and we don't look at the bigger picture, which is we've all acquired a debt that we're unable to pay. And, and fundamentally why we're here is because Christ has paid the ultimate debt for us. And we are, he, he compares so many things um, to that, but ultimately we are forgiven because of, of Christ's gift uh, uh, for us. Um, so I will I could probably go on forever, but I will stop there before I get shut off. <laughs> so um, just to just kind of wrap that up, um, a lot of it has to do with the attitude and the mindset behind it. If you're trying to use debt, quote unquote, in some way to get rich, it's, you're really potentially setting yourself up uh, for some really disastrous results. And, and even I'll, I'll add to this, Don, because we were talking about this when we were going through this, you know. God set up for the nation of Israel the opportunity to borrow from other people in the nation of Israel. But like Don was saying, the year of Jubilee it was only a seven-year time frame, and then it was the debt was canceled. Um, and if you tried to charge uh, an inordinate amount of interest, say 17%, um, God actually said, that's a sin. You can't do that. You, you cannot, that's, that's highway robbery. You cannot do that. So I, I think, you know, we tend to want to deal in black and white stuff all the time. And there are certainly some things that God is absolutely black and white about. Um, and this is one of those categories that, you know, it's never a great thing. It's, it's just not. Um, and, uh, in fact, so much so that in Proverbs it says, when you're in debt of any kind, do everything you can to get out as fast as you possibly can. Does that make sense? Does that help? Got it? Okay. Um, next one. Is it better to pay off my mortgage or to invest into my retirement plan? Yes, yeah, so I'll say that this is a, a common question that we get on a regular basis, and I think it, it piggybacks a little bit on the last question of what is good debt or bad debt, which is just kind of an, an interesting thought there. Um, I'm also going to add something into this question because we, we get this a lot too. So is it better to pay off my mortgage, invest in my college or my kids' college funding, or uh, invest in my own retirement? So that's, that is a common question that we get that, that gets thrown at us a lot. It's something we go through, again, in detail with the individuals that are in FPU because it is completely dependent upon your situation, right? Um, as a matter of fact, we, we started to teach that you do all three of those things simultaneously and uh, that it's kind of dependent upon your situation in terms of how much you do for one or the other or whether you overemphasize um, one or the other. And again, that depends on several factors, right? If you're if you're um, like, like Dave and Don sitting up here much closer to retirement than, say, myself, you know, <laughs> I waited till the end to say that. Um, yeah, do you have the mute button for worship leader <laughs> four, Mike? <laughs> um, but, you know, if you're closer to that retirement age, you, you may want to consider um, investing more. Or you may want to consider, if you're close to paying off your home, taking that, uh, that opportunity to do so. Because if you're in those positions, I mean, just imagine your, your budget for a moment with no uh, house payment on it, how, how much you would have left, and, and how you can bless uh, generously others um, with, with that, that difference in, in your income, right? Um, how you can invest in different ways. If you're, if you're younger and, you know, you're looking at a, a 15 year mortgage and you're one year in, maybe you could do a little bit more and, and cut the life of that loan down. But then you're taking away the, you know, your, 
greatest uh, wealth building tool, which is, you know, that investing. So it really depends upon your situation. Um, you know, again, as we look into the Bible and look into other aspects, it doesn't, it doesn't talk about retirement versus your home or anything like that. I don't have anything to quote there. But um, our goal and, and your goal should be to look into your heart and figure out a, a plan that, that works for you um, if you're on your own or you and your spouse if you're together, um, and one that you agree on that, that can glorify God and, and help your children's children in the future. Yeah, I'll just add uh, to that. So with um, FPU, there's a lot of things actually that I that I don't agree with Dave Ramsey on, but there's a whole lot more that I do agree with him on. And I know he's tried to align FPU to align to God's principles, and that's what matters. And so we've seen it be very, very practical in a lot of steps. Um, and so a lot of people say, well, I don't like that he says this. I've heard that for years. I don't like that he, well, I don't like that something else as well. But you know what? He's proven a lot of things um, with the, the system. And so what I like about the system is it's, now, one of the things I don't like about it is it's actually a, a, a one-size-fits-all. He has to put out the curriculum. He has to speak to millions of people. Um, so my favorite part about FPU or like the thing we do tonight is after we kind of present stuff is talking about each individual circumstance because I've uh, financial coached many, many people and couples over the years, and almost every single one of them is different. So as we're asking these very specific questions, my answer has been very different across the board on those. So I would just say that is we're trying to answer these questions like it's yes, no, one, zero type of thing, and really every one of them is going to come down um, outside. Not God's principles aren't going to change, but how we apply those is going to be individual to you. Yeah, and just to kind of put a pin in it, <clears throat> and then we'll ask the next question. I want to be very clear. Um, although we teach Financial Peace University, uh, we do not worship at the altar of Dave Ramsey. Um, that's just that's just not not the reality. I, I, we believe he loves Jesus. We believe he does the best that he can to teach that. But again, much of what FPU is is behavior change. Um, and so you go, well, yeah, but from a financial standpoint, I'm paying two percent, two point four percent on my mortgage, and I can earn this over here. Like, yeah, we, you're right. We totally get it from a financial standpoint. That seems like the wiser thing to do. The problem is you also have $875,000 worth of credit card debt over here. So let's change your behavior um, because that's really so much of this financial stuff. And the reason that people are in debt is not necessarily because they crunched the numbers and the interest rates were great. Uh, it was because they had to have that new pair of shoes uh, or, you know, the, the really cool um, nail salon thing with the polka dots. And ladies, we know that you don't do that for guys because we don't care. Uh, you do that for all the other women that are go, ooh, look at those polka dots on your fingernails. So that's the reason, right? So it's a behavior change thing. And that's why I know some people that are like accountants and that type of thing. Like, I don't like Dave Ramsey because if you work the math, listen, if we could work the math, we wouldn't be in debt the way that we are. Okay? So it's a behavior change thing in doing that. Um, and uh, I think all of us could go, yeah, there's this particular part of Dave Ramsey that I, we don't do it that way in our household because of, you know, because of our certain situation. So pl please uh, understand it with that. So all right, next question. Uh, how does God feel about building, did I jump? Uh, oh, did I cut you off? I'm sorry. Okay. I saw your mic go up, so I was like, sorry. Um, cut that. Uh, how does God feel about building wealth for a corporation instead of his kingdom? As an accountant for an LLC, I've always wondered that. So uh, we looked at this question. We were a little unsure exactly what was being asked at that point. So if, if we miss it, feel free to come up and uh, uh, talk to one of us after this. There's, there's a few ways we could think about that. One of them is if, if, if it's a big corporation that's not, you know, saving for the kingdom, um, should, should I even be working for them? Is that okay? So first of all, I think one of the guiding principles when we think about work is Colossians uh, 3, 23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as for working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know you will receive inheritance from the Lord as, as a reward. It is the Lord your Christ you are serving. So it's who do we think of? We're not, we're not fundamentally working for the corporation. We're working for God first, and we're glorifying him by the way we, we serve them. So um, I, it's not wrong to work for them. Also, there's a lot that can be done in those corporations. They can help individuals and families develop wealth who they can then give in a way that honors God. Um, you can look at the bigger picture beyond wealth. What about how we serve at work, who, the, our testimony among those people? Um, you know, one, the, one thing that came to mind was the story of Zacchaeus. He was a corrupt person working for a corrupt government, 
right, uh, collecting taxes, and he was, uh, he was doing it uh, in a way to just, uh, based on greed. Um, and when he met Christ, he changed. He promised to give back four times um, what he had stolen from other people. And God turned something that looked initially bad, and he, he turned it into a, a blessing for his people, if we assume that he went ahead um, and went through with that. So th- there's, there's nothing wrong with, with working for somebody that's doing that. Also, corporations are run by people, so there's a lot of people that are probably doing good on those. I actually know my brother-in-law works for a group called Ambassador Group. They're um, an, an equity firm. So if you think of equity firms, uh, they made $2 billion in revenue last year. Think of that number, $2 billion in revenue last year. Um, and uh, he, they, it is run by a Christian, and they have um, their mission is investing for the glory of God. And part of their um, strategic goals are for results, uh, for performance that results in better people, better community, and a better life to glorify God. They have 4,500 employees and $2 billion in revenue last year. And um, God can use corporations as well um, as essentially an institution to do good and to do his will. So whether we're working for one that's not glorifying him, we as individuals can glorify him in what we're doing there. Yeah, so just to add on to that, so I have the privilege of working for a large corporation myself. And so as as a part of that, I get to do things that uh, these days I, I really enjoy and I get to be very passionate about and work and work through and work for. But as a part, of, a part of working through a corporation, I've actually had people above me or that I work with that have spoke up and, um, and honored God in different ways. Pe- people have actually started Bible studies through the corporation as a part of you know, free speech efforts and, and brought more people together and, and glorified God in that way. And they've encouraged me to speak out more, um, you know, kind of about God and sharing God in that way. And then totally unexpected. Um, I've actually had uh, conversations with people where they're like, hey, everything is failing. Everything is really bad, but you're really calm. Like, what is wrong? And I'm like, well, first off, that's my natural response is to just like let everything happen and stay calm, which is, I guess, a unique trait. But um, most of that, though. Great meds. Is that it? Okay. (laughs) I don't know where those are hidden. I'll have to talk to Melissa afterwards. Maybe they're slipped in. Um, but yeah, so I mean, as we've had those conversations, though, and it kind of as we've gone through that, they're like, how do you do that? And I said, well, my faith is not in the corporation. My faith is in God, right? And he put me in this position. He put me in a certain circum- cer- certain circumstance so that I could glorify them. It, if that means that I fail, then I fail. But uh, I'm going to do it in a way that, that honors and glorifies them. And then having those conversations has led to them wanting to step out in their faith, wanting to know who God is. And through a corporation who at some times can seem to be against God by working for his kingdom instead of focused on on the corporation, I've been able to glorify God and bring people to God. So just saying it's a tool or it's a resource, maybe not focus so much on the end means, but on your um, functionality within that and how you can glorify uh, God through working for a corporation or, or supporting a corporation at times. Okay, I'm just looking at the time, so I want to get through these last two before we uh, before we close this. So the next question is: a thousand dollar emergency fund doesn't seem like it's enough nowadays. Should that number be higher, given the cost of so many things going up? So I did a little research on this, and I looked up the average cost of repairs in August 2023, and I pulled out the the biggest things that tend to kind of jump out. Um, so exterminator, right? If you have to, you have bugs, you have uh, all sorts of roaches and stuff that show up at your house. Um, you know, the, the average cost of an exterminator is $176. Um, exterior on the house, you know, something's going on, you need some wall patching, uh, your vinyl, you, you got your barbecue too close to the vinyl and it melted, um, and you need someone to come and, and fix it. Uh, the average cost of that's $261. Uh, average HVAC or your furnace or your HVAC, uh, $376. Average car repair is $548. Now, some of you are going, oh, well, my HVAC was. I totally get it. Totally understand it. Uh, Josh, how much was your uh, which was your uh, HVAC repair? Well, so we wanted a really good, nice system for the house that we renovated. So it was in the thousands of dollars, but we didn't repair it. We, we totally replaced everything. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, never mind. Bad idea. Um, <clears throat> But it can be really expensive. So here, but here's the thing. Here, here's the point behind it. First of all, this is not your emergency fund. Your emergency fund is three to six months worth 
of expenses. But that comes later. This just gives you the freedom to not keep using your credit card when something happens. That's what the $1,000 is. And 80% of those things that happen, like what I just said, those cover about 80% of the unexpected costs that take place. 80% of them are under that $1,000 mark. Uh, but even if it's over, it, let's say you have a car repair and it's $1,500. Now you're not going into debt another $1,500. You may have to pay an extra $500 later, but you've got 1000 of it covered. So it really is, again, we go back to it's a behavior change uh, where you start saving instead of spending all that you get, and you're starting to put that there so you have just a little bit of a baby buffer um, as you go into that. You guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, I was, that's exactly what I was going to say. That's not actually the emergency fund. There's a lot of people out there. It's going to vary depending on your situations. If you're single with an insecure job, that's going to be a certain amount. If you're a married couple with no kids and you have very secure jobs, that may look different. Um, if you've got a bunch of kids at home and one income, that's going to look different. But it's going to be it's going to be different based on your situation. A few of the people who, who recommend certain amounts, Dave Ramsey is the three to six months. Suze Orman says eight to 12 months. Uh, financial analyst Greg McBride, McBride says uh, six months. The author of I Will Teach You to Be Rich, he says, uh, Ramit Sethi, uh, 12 months. Jill Schlesinger, she's a business, business analyst in CBS, she says 12 months. Uh, Eric Maldano, uh, he's a CFP advisor, he says 6 to 12 months. Now, some of you, you got a little pale when you heard me say 12 months, a uh, one year of emergency fund. Whoa, what? That's crazy. Again, that's what we're looking at there. This is the starter. This is a change in behavior. Um, and a guiding principle, um, a couple of these, Proverbs 21 says, the wise have wealth and luxury. Fools spend whatever they get. It's to stop spending everything we get. It's to stop looking at our checking account and saying, oh, there's money in there. I'm going to spend it. Um, and then Proverbs 27, 23 says, be sure to know the state of your flocks and pay close attention to your herds. Um, so it's not talking about, you know, for, for us, it's talking about what's the situation, what's our budget look like? And so we make decisions, um, based on those things. So, uh, should we have more than a thousand? Um, yes. And this is some, this is one of those things where as we look at your individual situation and through the, the class tonight and FPU, we get into more of the details and say why. And I think it's a big thing, by the way, when I, when we have these classes, I really like people to know the why, because there's another question that's going to come up down the road. And I want you to understand the, the principles behind it, the biblical principles or even the financial principles so that you can make more decisions down the road and not just follow a simple set of instructions. I tell you, when you, when you read that verse about flocks and herds, all the women that have chickens and goats got really excited. Okay. <laughs> all right, last, last question. Uh, we haven't bought the house, house yet. Exclamation point. Uh, what would you advise we do before we make that jump of looking for houses? Um, not do what I did. Uh, and that's when I bought my first house. So uh, when, when, what we try to talk through with people uh, when it comes to buying a house, because that is the American dream is, is to have a house and, and to share it with a spouse and have a wonderful family and opportunity and spend lots of time in a house that you love um, and that, that you appreciate. Uh, the, the best way to buy a house is if you have 100% down, if you can just straight buy the house. I know that that's a shock and that's an awe and you're going to say that nobody ever does that. But I know a hand handful of people that actually have done that. It is possible, and you can do that over time. Now, I know the rest of us, we're impatient, and we're going to jump into that. And so we talk about a 15-year fixed mortgage with 20% uh, down, right? So that's, that's really where you want to be. Um, the other thing that you want to consider, as we just mentioned, is the, uh, the maintenance consideration. Dave hinted that we had some HVAC issues. Um, we, we recently purchased, when I say recently, within the last uh, few years, we, we purchased my childhood home from my mom and my dad, which was built 30 years ago, and we decided to renovate and, and live in it. Um, we've had uh, multiple issues with a dishwasher that resulted in lots of replacement of hardwood floor, which was not cheap. Uh, we had a washer and dryer go out, which, you know, you can buy a cheap one, but why do that if you can have the one of the future? Um, we had the HVAC go out, which we mentioned. Um, hey, there's this thing called an ash beetle that eats ash trees. Uh, we had to take six now ash trees out that um, had to pay for because they're too close to the house, at least for me to trust myself to do. Um, I think Melissa appreciated that. But I mean, it's just trying to say 
that there that there is not just the the twenty five percent of your income that should go to your home, which is what we try to encourage people to limit it to, right? Because we'll talk about that more tonight in detail in the more than morning workshop about how to establish your budget, how much each of the percentages should be. And an FPU will go through what is a good home, what is a bad home, how to invest, how to do inspections. We'll go through all those details when it comes to buying a home. So if you're looking to do that, I'd encourage you to come tonight to get the basics. And if you're really serious about doing that, to jump into FPU so we can help you through that. But you also want that three to six months of expenses set aside because while that $1,000 is nice for Murphy protection, which by the way, sometimes you making a budget correctly is Murphy protection. In case in anybody didn't know, it's October and in December is Christmas. If you're going to buy presents for somebody, it's not an emergency. It's the same day every year. You shouldn't be surprised by it, right? So you can be your own Murphy in those situations, and so having that buffer helps with that. But when it comes to buying a home, having that buffer, considering maintenance costs, making sure that you have that full emergency fund uh, is essential. And we often get people that ask the follow-up question is, why should I rent over buy? You know, I could go buy a home tomorrow and start, you know, accruing the asset that is a home. Oh, I, I could rent, which the market right now for both home buying and renting is ridiculous, but I go rent a home for the same amount as I can buy a home. Well, let me, let me ask a few questions for you. Have you ever done any plumbing work, electrical work, HVAC, anything like that? If the answer is no to all that, um, then you're going to have to either do that yourself or pay somebody like $200 or $300 an hour to do it. YouTube. YouTube is awesome. Uh, and then when you burn your house down because you... <laughs> hook the black wire to the red wire because it was built in 1980 instead of 2000, yeah, you run into a problem. So I'm, I, I'm just saying that there's a distinct difference there, and you, we do talk through needing to have that three to six months to handle that maintenance. Um, and that's one reason why you may want to rent maybe for a year or two instead of buying so that you can be fully prepared to buy that house and to jump into that. I think the biggest thing, and we'll, we'll close with this, I think the biggest thing that, that Josh, you said that, I, that, that we, in fact, we were talking about, we all, <clears throat> if you don't know what PMI is, okay, PMI is what's called private mortgage insurance. Um, the rough definition of private mortgage insurance is the bank taking more of your money and you get nothing back. So PMI is, if you look at your mortgage statement, you'll see a little thing that says PMI. And what it is, is it's you paying the bank so that they can buy insurance just in case you stop paying so they still get paid. That's what PMI is. You, it is no benefit to you whatsoever. And unless you have an 80%, um, unless you have at least 20% equity in your home, uh, then you will be paying that. So that's why we always say, listen, if you can you know, do the 20% down, so you're not paying PMI. Uh, because if you're paying PMI, it is just wasted money. And, and it's, uh, we were just talking about this this last week. It, it actually it can vary. In fact, some of you in our, in our, um, in, in our group, we were, we were talking about it because a couple of them, all of a sudden their mortgage just went up 150 bucks, 200 bucks a month. What is that all about? Well, it's, it's that PMI. They just decided to increase it, and you have no say over it. And uh, when you get that 20% equity, you can have it removed from your mortgage, if you don't have it removed, the bank will not remove it for you, just so you know. The only time they're required to remove it is when you get to 25% equity. So you'll continue to pay that PMI, even though you don't have to, for years until, uh, you know, the bank does it. So that, that's one of the biggest things that, that when it comes to mortgages that we say, hey, get, get that done first. Anything you guys want to share in closing? Just don't lose the big... The bigger picture, we got a lot of really practical questions here. Um, it's this flows into everything else. It's glorifying God with our lives, with our money, as well as every other piece uh, of it. And so there's a lot of little ways we can do that when we get into the minutia, and we love to talk about those in the classes. Um, but don't ever think of it as I'm, I'm I'm tithing or I'm out of debt. That's the end goal is not the tithe or getting out and be debt free, right? The goal is glorifying God with what we do. And so let's always keep that um, in, in mind as we're talking through these issues. All right, cool. If you had any of those questions that came up and I saw some of you pull things in writing, make sure you drop those in the Giving Connect boxes so that we can answer those for you. Uh, so let's, uh, let's pray and we'll turn it back over to the worship team. Father God, we thank you so much 
for giving us the ability to be able to hear from you, uh, to be able to know what you want us to do and how you want us to handle the resources that you've given us. And God, sometimes it can be scary and overwhelming. And God, I know um, just in conversations, there are people here today that the debt is, is crushing and it's scary and it's terrifying uh, and it's overwhelming. And God just, th- th- they've got to move uh, 15 feet just to get to the water line, not even to be able to, to get out of it. So God, I pray that this day as we've gone through these things, first of all, they'd be inspired to go, okay, I'm going to take these next steps. I'm going to do some of these things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come tonight for the More Than Money workshop. I'm going to sign up for FPU. I'm going to move in this direction. And God, it may take a few years, but I'm committing myself to be free, to be able to be the man or the woman or the couple or the family that you've called us to be in this area of finances. And God, I pray that as we leave this place, we're not, play, we're not leave with this like overwhelming, like, oh, it's so crushing, but God, a freedom and an understanding that, that you'll, you'll show us the way out. You'll show us the steps that we need to take to be able to get free and so that we can celebrate before you and pursue the calling that you have for our life because that's, that's the bottom line. That's what it's all about to be able to worship you freely, to be able to have you as our priority, to be able to be the men and women that you've called us to be. And God, we thank you for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's